Hey guys, thanks for joining me today. I have a special guest today, Nathan Hebert. He is the owner and franchisee for the Brothers That Just Do Gutters in the San Antonio territory. Really interesting guy. We've talked a number of times offline. I really enjoyed my conversations with him. He's an interesting cat. Uh, a fast and furious buddy of mine now from down in Texas. He's a, are you six years in the gutter business or were you doing something before Brothers in the gutter? Actually, I started gutters in 2006. So we're quite oh, a few years. Quite a while. Few okay. years in it. Yep. Oh, so I have a lot of questions for you then. So. <laughs> He's been in the business uh, just a few years less than me. It looks like about 18 or 19 years. And interesting, interestingly enough, he's just a year, year and a half younger than me. So we're kind of on the same trajectory. I think that's why I probably gravitate towards Nathan. And uh, we've had some nice, warm and fuzzy conversations. And I thought, hey, let's get this guy on this podcast. He's definitely a, an elder statesman and has... Uh, some experience and uh, carries himself well. And I, I think he'd be, um, you know, a very interesting guest on the show. So Nathan, welcome. And thank you for joining me today. Well, I appreciate you having me, Frank. I figured this would be kind of fun to uh, catch up with you a little bit. I know I've been following your stuff for a few years on, on social media. So uh, cool. it's good to talk with you in your own environment here. Absolutely. Yeah. You have me in my, uh, in, in the wild, in my, in my, in my own, uh, crazy environment here. This is like one of few times I've been out of the house in the last couple of weeks. I had that knee replacement and, uh, it's good to get out and stretch the legs, uh, pun intended and, uh, get back into the office. So I'm glad we're here doing this. So let's get into this. When you got into business, what, give me the, uh, the, the origin story. How did you get into business? What brought you into the gutter world? We all ha kind of have our own little crazy story. Well, um, I've always been kind of self-employed. I grew up on the farm in Alberta, Canada, so I'm Canadian. Oh, wow. by birth. Um, and then in the sometime when in my teen years, we started, my dad and I started a roofing business in the summertime to support our farming habit. Um, our and farming then, habit. Yeah. <laughs> as a late teen, I was entrepreneurial, I guess. I was like, hey, can I farm some of my own land? And so my dad would actually set aside acres that I could invest my own money in, rent equipment wow. from him, and actually set me up how to do business, you know, as a teenager. That's amazing. And, and so I always had a hard time working for somebody after that because I was like, man, I, I know I can do stuff on my own. Self-sufficient. You knew how to get things done. But we actually had to sell the farm back in 99, and uh, we went full-time into roofing together. Um, but I got married to a Texan, and that you know, even though I, I had her up in Canada for a couple of years, she ended up dragging me back to Texas and uh, yeah. we ended up living here. Nice. And the initial job I came down for didn't work out. And so I was like, well, I know roofing. And so I'm going to go back into roofing. And so I started my own roofing business from nothing. Like I just had, I didn't even have a pickup truck. I borrowed a trailer. I borrowed a truck for a couple of months. Love it. Saved up enough cash to buy a truck and then buy a trailer and did some roofing stuff for a few years. But then the gutter, um, enough customers, my roofing customers, enough of them were requesting gutters to make it worth looking into having a gutter machine. Sure. And I didn't know anything about it. Um, so I was like, you know, at, at this point, that's a big deal for me. You know, buying a gutter machine setup was a huge investment. Yeah, an investment, especially when we were young. Yeah, we, we were small time and just me and a couple of guys working. And so, you know, we pondered on it for a long time, but then... In 06, uh, which was about four years after I started my roofing business, I, I set up a gutter um, trailer and I actually really enjoyed that work. I was like, man, if I could make a full time living doing just gutters, that would be awesome. So you were roofing and doing the gutters yourself? You were hands yeah. on getting it done? Yeah, I was the chuck in the truck guy, man. We, okay. we, had, we ended up getting a standing seam machine and we did a lot of shingle roofing and um, that kind of thing. But you know, Asphalt Texas, residential? Was that the mainstay of that? Yeah, residential. Um, Texas is a tough place to roof, man. 110 in the summer. Wow, I don't know how you guys worked on it. I really don't. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, but that's why I enjoyed the gutter work a little more. It's not quite as intense, you know. It's true. It's, you're in, you're out. You could kind of zip in and out of there and get in the shade again, right? Yeah. You do your downspots in the shade if you're smart enough. You follow the shade around the house, you know. So but, did you drop the roofing or did you stick with that and keep the two running simultaneously? I phased out the roofing and then ended up selling all my tools so I wouldn't be tempted to get back in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's smart. What was, was it? Were you just so much easier on the gutter side or the liability or all of the above? Was it just kind of... Well, it's all the above. You know, with roofing, there's um, there's a lot of liability. You open up somebody's roof and it rains at the wrong Anything time. Anything can happen. 
you know, you're responsible for drywall and all kinds of other stuff you don't really know how to do. So you're right. That was, um, especially after a drought, you know, you go through eight months of no rain in South Texas and you've done, you know, 150 roofs and then it rains for three days straight. You're not even sleeping at night because you know you're going to get calls. About oh, yeah. Stuff. There's always a couple calls, right? There's something. Yeah. So an errant the, nail head is all it takes, right? The liability and just being in and out like with the gutter business, it's so nice. You're, you're in and out and you're done and everybody's happy. You don't spend too much time with the customer. You can make them really happy really fast. And that sure. was appealing to me. So what were you branded as at the time? You had your own business name? Was it a... I had Hebert Gutters. Yep. Right. Hebert Gutters for 13 years. And then uh, I actually had a back injury. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, we talked just, about that. You know, I had a back injury and I, I was basically, since I was the only guy really installing, um, my back would act up and I'd be in bed for two, three weeks flat. Oof, no really? work. And so the truck would be in the shop and parked and I'd like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Yeah. I don't have enough volume to hire somebody to do the work for me. You know, at that point in my life, I was just, I, I had had a couple of gutter crew or roofing crews and I was sort of happy just not having employees. Sure. You know, I had one guy who could help me the four days a week that I was working because, you know, the fifth or sixth day I would be out either getting materials or doing sales or whatever because I was doing everything myself. Right. Um, so I had a guy who was available to help me on whenever days we were doing gutters. And I liked that. It, it was nice for me. It was We made good money. You know, it was simple. Keep everything in, in-house and it was fine. But with some uh, back issues and some other things, I just I wanted to scale my business or do something different you know, so that I could get off the truck. But, you know, I love the gutter business. I love the gutter world. It, I, I really enjoy that. Um, but and there's I a time and a place, it. right? I mean, we all evolve. I Man, I know it now with this, this second knee I'm dealing with. You had the back issues. Like, that's the hardest part. The young guys don't, they're, they're too bulletproof at the time to even consider where the what, what the future holds, right? You just, you, you think you're invincible. You're never going to slow down. And you really don't prepare unless you're, you're a brilliant person and you're uh, reasonable or maybe dad or somebody kind of grabbed you and said, Hey, listen, this is not always going to, you're not always going to feel uh, so virile and strong. Like there's going to be a time when it starts changing. So, you know, to plan for that is uh, it takes a real sage individual. Yeah. And, and we, as contractors, you're always like, yeah, you can make good money, but if you're not really planning for your future, it's not like you can sell your gutter business for anything at the end of the day, you know, it's no. basically worth what your equipment is and maybe a few contacts, you know, that's right. really what it ends up being. So there's no real future. So you're not really making as much money as you think you are when you're contracting on your own. So um, for those that don't know, Nathan, he's obviously, he's got the shirt on. You can see it right, right there in the camera. He's a franchisee with brothers that just do gutters and you, what's the, what's the uh, territory in Texas you're in? We're in San Antonio and surrounding area. So we have, we have all of San Antonio and, you know, so question. obviously, you know, brothers does wonderful, right? I mean, they, they really fast track things. I know they brought in a third party and uh, basically exploded, right? I don't know the hundred and 138. I don't know what the actual number is. I'm sure you do, but somewhere in that realm, 130 plus franchisees. I mean, that is, that is the measure of success out of curiosity. And, you know, I, I, my brain is always open to any kind of franchise scenario. Just as a student of the game, I'm always talking, uh, well, you know, my guy, my, uh, my right hand man, George, his brother's involved in uh, a wings operation and used to be involved in a, in a subway franchise. We're always talking business, 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 because I just like to listen and understand how these things come together. What, how did you trip over these guys? Where did you find them? Was it at a trade show? Like, where did you stumble on these guys? It was a YouTube video because while I was, you know, hurt and looking for a possible way to change up my business to get off the truck, I was actually, I had helped a buddy start another gutter company in Houston. And I was thinking, man, I could franchise my business or just kind of spread out and maybe make a little money that way. Or, you know, I was, I had all kinds of possibilities going in my head sure. about how I could grow. Um, and I ran across a video of, of Ryan and Ken Parsons talking about their brother's gutters. And I was like, well, these guys are doing something. I'm just going to go pick their brain so I can copy them. Right. So I called <laughs> them up and uh, we started having a conversation and I realized the, the in-depth uh, stuff that they had gone through to create this franchise. Right. And I was like, there's no way that I'm going to spend five to seven years trying to build something that I want today. They already right? had it figured out, right? Might as well just jump in. Yeah. So I was like, I talked with them quite a bit and we went up to New York to meet them. 
And what it ended up being is for me in my business as a gutter guy, it was a plug and play set of systems for me to grow immediately. In other words, stuff SOPs, that I didn't have to tell. all the manuals, all the yeah, you got the CRMs, you got the training systems, you got the support, you have a call center, you have everything that you need, like just right away. To and for me, I, I made the calculations. I you know, yes, I could develop some of these things myself. It would probably take me three to five years to test out different systems and CRMs and things that fit for me and that kind of thing, or just jump into this, just go with what they have and see what, how it works. And so, <laughs> you know, you and I were talking about risk taking. It's really tough um, going from your own named business to, to giving up all that in a lot of ways, your identity there is. and um, going with something that someone else has designed. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff there in my, as far as head trash for me. But I mean, you always knew you had that you could fall back on it. I'm sure in your mind that that was plan B. Right. I mean, if it didn't work out, you knew you always had your 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 toolbox of skills, you know, your skill sets that you could lean on. And I'm sure that gave you a little comfort. Yeah, I'm not I'm not scared to go start another business. That's not the issue, you know. So um, but what I did with them year one, I said, look, here's what I made last year. Here's what I netted last year. I don't know anything about your stupid franchise system, but yeah. um, I want to net the same thing this year. My year one. I don't want to lose money. I don't want to spend time building this business to lose money. Yeah, I said, that makes sense. Year one. Sacrifice 12 months, up. right? It's like put up or, sh or shut up. Let's see what That's we can right. do in the 12 months. So I'm and imagining then, you you hit the numbers. You made it we work. Did. We hit the numbers. We yeah. built a, we built a budget with their system, and, we, and, we, and they said, this is what you need to do. Here's what we, our experience is. I was only franchise number 11, so it was pretty wow. young back then. All right. Um, yeah, back to my point. These guys really blew it up fast. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, but we, we set a bunch of records for the franchise because I was just wanting to speed grow to a certain point where I had enough cash flow to do the things that I wanted to do personally. Number one, being out of the field. Sure. So that that's one thing about you that I see. It looks like you have quite a nice lifestyle. I see you doing the things I like to do. You look like you're an outdoorsman. I see Jeeps on giant boulders. I see campers. I see big smiles and uh, pickup trucks. I mean, things are, things are good, right? We, we are enjoying life the way we designed it right now. And it's really, you know, Frank, for a long time, yeah, as a contractor, I know you know this pain, you either have money or you have time, but That's you right. never have both. That's right. Um, it's a major and for the sacrifice. Last, yeah. And for the last two to three years, we've built our business to the point where we can have a little bit of both. And that's been really, really Good cool. For you. Yeah. One thing I love about you too, and, and this is why it pans out nicely for you and your, your position in life. Uh, we were talking offline a little while ago. Uh, Nathan is a grandfather. He's, <laughs> he's 46. I'm 47. He's a grandfather. We're literally bookends. We're on either ends of the spectrum here. I have a two-year-old. I'm a <laughs> dinosaur with a baby. And Nathan is, uh, you know, a middle-aged gentleman with uh, kids that are adults, and he's got a, a, a grandchild. So is it just one grandchild or you have a few? A few grandchild. Oh, my <laughs> Lord, my friend. My daughter actually had a baby in January and my son had Congratulations. A, had his son back in the uh, end of May. So he's, he's going to be a year, a year old here. A you bit. young guys, and I hear a lot of you chirping on Facebook. You know, it really is, it's pick your poison. I had uh, a phenomenal run in my 20s and my 30s. I did everything you could ever imagine and more. Trust me, I went a little extra. <laughs> I did it all and uh, no regrets. And I have beautiful, beautiful, amazing children and I'm, I'm thrilled. But, you know, these old bones, man, these old bones are feeling it. You got some uh, new knees, though. There's that. <laughs> yeah. You know, we put these bionic uh, joints in action and see what we can do with these things. But um, good for you, man. It sounds like everything came together and it was all by your decisive action. You had a design and you executed on it and everything came together nicely. Um, do you mind if I ask, and I, I kind of always ask this question and us entrepreneurs like to share this stuff. How are you doing in, uh, in revenues in a year? Are you, what kind of numbers are you seeing? Um, last three years, we've been just over $3 million in gutters. It's phenomenal. Um, so, and you're only doing gutters, gutter, covers, gutters, cleanings. No gutters and cleanings and guards really is all we do. We don't even do facial repair. We have a guy on call that does that for us. Um, it's a little different in here in Texas. There's no facial wrap or anything really. So it's all custom painted wood sure. or something like that. So it's a little just, more. Just for inspiration for the guys at home. And I know it's proprietary stuff. I'm not trying to poke a prod for sure, but would you say the secret sauce is in the market marketing formula? 
what they tell you where to where to put the money and how to do it? You think that that they that's have only piece of the puzzle. Um, really, really, the formula is in systemizing things. And you know, I hear you guys talk about this all the time too. And yeah, it's true. It's, it's systemizing because systems replace people. And if you can systemize, I mean, there's no other place I could have gone, honestly, uh, to 10x my business in three years. No. You know, I went from grossing 350,000 to to 3.4 million in 20. I, I did 350,000 in 2018 in my own gutter business as a truck in the truck. Right. And in 2022, we did 3.4 million. So give us so, an idea on how you leverage these SOPs. Is it something that you guys, you know, uh, senior management ownership is sticking their nose in and uh, flipping pages daily, or uh, you have the staff doing that as well. I mean, how do you, from the top down, how do people access these SOPs? They're available digitally online in a Google Drive. Like, how are you putting these in, in place for everybody to leverage and uh, win on? Yeah, so the, I mean, it's 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 different systems that we have built in for anywhere from training. You know, in the field, we have we have systemized trainings that they can do online or on their phone. But for for management, there's we budget and it's all available for for them to watch and, and see through the year. And then we have coaching calls. Um, we have accountability groups that we that we get on online with with other franchisees um, and, and corporate does a really good job of, of support uh, with each franchisee. And you really feel like a part of a bigger team. That's you awesome. know, I'm not just an owner out here doing things on my own. Um, and because I probably couldn't, I probably couldn't have done this on my own. Like I said, it would have taken a long time to do sure. what we have done. I mean, so you and, and other owners and other uh, franchisees and such, I do. I, that's one thing that I do see that's consistent across territories and across ownership is that there is this familial family warmth and um, team team feel. It's very, very distinct and, and, and uh, clear and present with brothers that just do gutters for you people at home pay attention listen up you may not be a franchisee you might not be involved in something like this but that type of environment needs to be instilled in your business i think nathan would agree that it's it's critical that you know people come to work they want to feel like they're a part of a, a greater good uh it's larger than them and each of us individually it's um a collective uh, net worth is far greater than each, you know each of us individually. Do you think that's what drives your staff? Is that that feeling? Absolutely. In fact, we we take key staff with us to like the conference every year, for instance. And and for some reason, and I know this personally, but for some reason, even people that are you know a solutionist or a salesperson that come to our conference and meet you know forty other salespeople from other locations, all of a sudden they just feel like they're just part of a bigger team and sure. they're inspired and it's it's great, you know it has a lot to do with it because when you're, when you stand alone somewhere, um, the hard times, which there always is, they seem a lot harder, but if you can call somebody who you're a buddy with now and just say, Hey, what did you do when, you know, half your installers walked off the job, you know, well, sure. well we, you know, this, yeah, that happened to us two years ago. And this is what we, Oh, okay. Well, that's, you'll get over it. You know, it'll be fine. You know, it's not the end of the road yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah, we've made some great friends inside the franchise and some really close people that we that we hang out with all the time. So how, yeah, how often do you guys congregate as a, a, a nation? You know, a, uh, once a year we have our national conference, but we've actually personally made it a point to to go around and see some of our um, oh, franchise friends. You know, personally in our travels, we'll we'll go meet up with people. You find everybody's highly supportive. There's no uh, like inner competition amongst you. There's only only pretty healthy competition. I mean, you know, of course, there's always little revenue awards and things that are, yeah. you know, the next guy wants to. But we, like I said, That's we healthy. came in pretty strong and we set a bunch of records. And I know that we're not going to be the last to set records. And I'm actually really happy to see other franchisees coming up and be like, we're going to beat San Antonio. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> it's not like they're in my territory competing against me. So go for it, man. Sure. You know, shout out to uh, people like Ben Conowitz, uh, Tina Hart. Other individuals that, again, are not doing the franchise thing, but have incorporated similar uh, mantras and approaches to the business environment and, you know, making it a family and just, you know, self, you know, inner promotion and jackets and coolers and acknowledging birthdays. And I see this stuff going on. We're really making a concerted effort here at my, at my place. You know, sometimes you have ebbs and flows and uh, transitions in business. 
And um, I literally have family in the business. And then honestly, the people that I choose to work with, the people that I bring in here, I really feel our family. I, I, you know, I want that closeness and we have it, but you know, I could learn from others. And um, some of you guys out there, again, Tina, Ben, you guys are doing it big. Jimmy, there's other folks that are, uh, uh, Corey, my man, Corey, uh, Corey J, he's killing it with that, that effect. It's down to like uniforms and look, and it, you know, it's almost gives you like an army type of approach where if everybody's in nice gear and they, they look similar, they feel a certain way, right? It's, there's yeah. like a brotherhood and an allegiance with that. What do you guys do with, um, with uniforms and that sort of thing? What's your approach on that? Uh, yeah, we definitely require everyone to kind of look the same on the job. Uh, you know, installers all have certain shirts. So we, we kind of give some input, get some input what they like. And so we order them all matching and, and we give those to them. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, every six months we give them a new batch of shirts so they can stay clean. And if they, if they're really dirty, you know, then we'll make sure they buy some. You always, <laughs> so you always got a couple of those pig pen guys on the crew, right? Yeah. You yeah. give them a shirt brand new the next day, the thing is destroyed. Yeah, <laughs> Covered in geo cell. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's the worst. The guys that wipe it on their pants all the time. Oh my gosh, just stop. It happens. Get a it happens. Especially guys, uh, guys are just, we're just pigs. It's yeah. There's anyway. Yeah. It's so, yeah, we kind of keep that as a, as a unit. Yeah. It's much better when everybody looks the same and people that drive. I totally agree. Up, you know, I'm a big proponent great. of that. It's really hard to see, see yeah. that through. I mean, uh, how many shirts you need to give a guy, you know, each individual to make sure that they always have something clean and they're not blaming it on the laundry. Well, if there's five work days in a week, six work days in a week, maybe you have to give them eight or nine. So if you're replacing shirts every six months, do you know that I'm just throwing, so it's an interesting question off the top of your head. Do you know what you budget a year for uniforms and, um, and that sort of stuff for the whole crew? Well, we get our shirts. I think we get our shirts for about 15 bucks a piece. So they're not too expensive. And then, um, we do either we've done a couple of things with the pants we either subscribe to a like a laundry service pant company who brings in pants or we just agree on a, a style of pant and we we, sure. we help them. we split the cost with them just buying half of the cost of their pants so that they all match cool. so i don't know off the top of the head i mean we varied anywhere from six crews to three crews so right now we're running three just going into four crews um so we don't have too many guys right now. We got seven seven guys in the field at the moment. Okay, how's the weather been down there? I heard saw somebody online talking about some hurricane or some uh, or some crazy storm that was hurricane like the other day. What's going on? Well, there? We got a little bit of rain this year finally, but I haven't uh, I haven't seen anything real crazy. We got some pretty decent rain in the San Antonio area yesterday morning. Uh, over, but uh, we celebrate rain. Uh, we do too. Last year was so tough. We had a major drought most of the year. I think we had. 11 inches all year long and our average is 26 so it was it was pretty brutal wow wow and you, yet you still are hitting numbers well we didn't hit the numbers we wanted to but we did we did over three million still which was really good for the year that we did yeah 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 we're doing we're doing three and change here but i do drainage which are generally big ticket you know far more expensive than rain gutter systems and we do a little bit of roofing i'm very selective on what i'll take on for roofing but um, actually, I just got a call yesterday. We just got a verbal on a $250,000 commercial roof. So, oh, nice. you know, we some years we crush it with roofing and other years, you know, they're just like low ticket residential. And I kind of mark them up high and try to hit it big or not take it. You know, I'm just yeah. not interested. It's for all the same reasons we talked about earlier, the liability and the do it. If you don't, If you don't really love it, then price it high. <laughs> totally. Now tell me, are you you're in other businesses, right? I know we were chatting offline, and I think you had a, a, a rental or an Airbnb or something. Are you are you doing good by your money and and um, spreading it around and investing in other things, or what are you up to these days? Well, we live in a bed and breakfast, so yes, our our cool. place here. We actually live in Uvalde, Texas, which is about eighty miles west of San Antonio. Oh wow! Uh, but the bed and breakfast here is, it, we've been here for nine years and uh, we have three cabins on the property and a big house with some rooms that we rent out. So Very that's kind of our family business that we run here locally. Um, and How yeah, you, we, like you, you into that? Is it? It's been interesting. It's been neat. You see all kinds of people from all over the world and yeah. get to hear stories. And yeah, it's, it's actually a really unique business to be in. And the people that come to bed and breakfast are usually you know, a little bit different than your Motel 6 kind of people. So, you, you know, you get to... Uh, city slickers like me. Yeah, city slickers <laughs> like me. <laughs> Show up in all the wrong gear. You don't know what they're doing. 
Yeah. And I, I try and do some property stuff. You know, we bought our location for our shop. We have 13 acres over there and built our own shop. So we're, we're building yes. value and some property there too. So um, yeah, I, I do try and take any profits that we can get and, and make some smarter moves with them for sure. Good for you. And, and um, how, how active are you in the business on the day to day at this point? Is it a 40 plus work, hour work week for you? Are you able to off, offload to a general manager or management? How, how, how's that structured? No, I've, I've decidedly structured it right now where I'm really um, not having to go into the shop. I probably go once every two weeks into the I was going to say that 80 miles is not easy. I, I was... no, it's not a great commute. And, uh, you know, we've been taking care of our grandson as a daycare for the last eight months. So really, we've been here for him. Um, and All right. So are we going to lean back on systems? I mean, how are you making that happen without any hiccups? Well, there's always hiccups, Frank. Come on. It's I, nothing. It was a loaded <laughs> question. I knew it. <laughs> But yeah, systems and, and the right people. You obviously have to put the right seats in the right, you know, the right people in the right seats on the business. Asses in seats, right? You got to right. get the right, the right asses. <laughs> and if, you, if you have people you trust that can, that can take part of your job from you and then you can hire somebody else to take another part of your job, then it becomes a lot easier. And I still obviously field phone calls daily through, from people in the business. And since I'm very well versed in the industry knowledge, I'll get calls from sales or installers every once in a while just to kind of poke through a, a hard place. But um, yeah, it's really, you know, I would say I maybe spend an hour or two on the, in, you know, kind of working in the day-to-day -day stuff of the business. And then I have other things that, you know, we do some, um, franchise stuff. I, I, I host, uh, some, a call with some of the local franchisees in Texas nice. and stuff like that. So, so I'm involved it, a bit in that. what's the trend in, in this particular franchise? Is it like, are there any owners that own multiple territories? What's the, what, how do guys tend to scale and grow within? Most of them actually own multiple territories and, and quite a few are owning um, large cities. Like uh, yeah. there's a couple that have purchased kind of like us. We have a very large territory with San Antonio. You know, it's two, almost two and a half million people in San Antonio. Wow. Alone. How big is that radius? A hundred uh, miles from the shop. We, we typically, I mean, our normal day uh, often is 30, 40 miles from the shop. So wow. All the way up to. I used to do that when I first started out, and it was brutal. It was just destroying all of us, but we had no choice because we were taking work anywhere we can get it. Now I'm yeah, like this local area. market. I mean, Texas is spread out anyway, so it's not a it's not that a big. True. You know, it's not real concentrated. But there's yeah, the franchises they differ a lot depending on the people. But there's some really cool people doing some really neat stuff around the country. So what's your, where do you go with this? Are you looking to scale and pick up new territories or you're kind of just clocking and things are good? What's your strategy? I would like to build this to where it's like, we're focusing on efficiency now, not so much getting more revenue, you know, big growth. You know, we yeah. did that to get to a certain scale, but right like now we're on, I'm doing it better and I want to keep more of it. You know, how can we be a great three and a half million dollar company? You know, how can we run that very efficiently? Yes. And, and then naturally grow, as needed, you know, maybe we grow to four, four, four point five in the next couple of years if we can get our efficiencies down. Right. Um, you know, then let that growth happen. But but growth alone isn't a isn't a telltale of anything. You know, revenue no, alone absolutely not. It doesn't mean much unless you're doing something with it. Right. I, I and I you know I say that you could look at it at any any number that's thrown out at you. Uh, linear footage in a day, uh, dollars yeah. dollars earned. Like how many dollars did you keep? You know, at the end right. of the year, what do you have in your pocket? I tell you, the offense in 21 years in business, I find playing offense is the easy part at this point because I've built the brand. I established the brand locally as a household name and they see our likeness. They see our logos. They know who we are. It's an easy sell. The hardest part is defense because it just seems like there's always some new expense. There's always some place money needs to get put. Um, there's always new equipment. There's always new staff. Uh, insurance just keeps going up. It's just incredible. The cost of living, uh, yeah. even just since COVID, it's just out of control. So the, the hardest part, I think, is in, is learning how to play defense yourself and or finding the right talent, like um, a strategic bookkeeper or an accountant or a CPA that really has some uh, you know, sharp pencils and knows how to really get down to the nitty gritty. And you got to pay for that, right? But you pay, you pay to save. So it's well worth it. Th those are household conversations. My wife uh, owns and runs the companies with me at this point. And, uh, and they, these are the things we talk about at night. It's defense, defense, defense. And it is, it is tough. 
Yeah, we had a, you know, during our experience, and I will say, you know, we actually made more money in 2021 doing 2 million than we did in 2022 doing 3.4. Yeah, no, um, there is that big, that, that big bump after you break that, that glass ceiling yeah. where you get just big enough where you actually are sucking wind. Yeah, all yeah. the money's going right out. Well, plus we learned the hard way that we didn't quite adjust our prices soon enough when materials bumped up. We, you know, we weren't watching some things super close and we, we, you know, three to six months later, we're like, holy crap, you know, we need to do something about this, but it's, sure. you're really too late. You've wasted a bunch of money. Um, so yeah, you got to keep going top of your metrics all the time. So where are you buying materials these days? We, uh, you know, I bought for so many years from Senox and um, they make a great product, but Spectre has really been courting us hard good, and good. doing a good job in service. And so we're, we're doing a lot with Spectre right now. We still do split between Synox and Spectra. Okay. Um, we like our buddies both. at Spectra. What's that? Uh, we said so we yeah. like our buddies at Spectra. There's some, there are some really good guys over there. They, they're doing a really good job. And, you know, um, it, that's I've a been, franchise thing though, right? Is it, it looks like there's some movement uh, amongst the franchise with Spectra. Is there some synergy happening? They do try real hard with the franchise as well. I mean, individually, they've been trying since they moved in here. But yeah, I think as a whole, it's a great platform for them to market to the whole country because it's yeah. established in a, in a gutter sure. franchise. But they still have to service us individually, you know, to get any business because I'm the, the reason the only reason um, I would move away from Senox is because of service and partially price. You know, they don't want to move on either one of those things. And in our local branch. Uh, the general manager needs to be fired 20 years ago. So let me get that right. Now, now materials and quality of product is one thing, but or, or price rather. When you talk about price, we know it's it's too high. You're not happy with that. But customer service is lacking, and they they refuse to budge on that. Is that what you're saying? They're, yeah, they're terrible. They, their GM is just terrible at our store. And oh, man. for since COVID, they quit deliveries. They just now in the last two months started delivering back to us. And I, because I keep on giving them a hard time, I'm like, look, there's no workaround. Is- you can't send that up the line. Oh, I have. I, you know, I know everybody there, but they're all they're all too proud and cocky of their stuff, man. I don't know what it is, but they they just aren't willing to deal. I just they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to replace the right people for for That'd them to do. Thing. And we were buying about a million dollars in materials for them for a couple of years. I would imagine I like, with those numbers, yeah. Like, sorry guys, you're not getting my business with this kind of behavior. <laughs> so, that's see you later. Not, that's just not good enough, you know. And it's and it's not about you even so much individually. Times have changed, right? We're in this. I, I keep saying it, and I'm going to continue to say it, we're in this renaissance. We're in this rain gutter industry renaissance, and all I need to do is pick up a phone, and I'm talking to you in Texas, right? Or I jump on Facebook and. I could say two, three things, and uh, I have 7,000 people in a Facebook group that all see it. So I don't know, man. I think, uh, you know, everybody's got to really mind their P's and Q's, especially when they're, out, they're doing B2B. You really yeah. need to up your game right now because there, there's nowhere to hide. There's no dark corners to hide in anymore. You're exposed. Right. Everybody yeah. sees what you're doing, and if, if you're doing Nathan dirty, I'm hearing about it, and everybody else is hearing about it, and it, it's, it's going to come back to bite you. It does. And they have good locations that have great service. I've heard from other franchisees and other people in the industry that they, they use them and that's fine. And they just don't hear. And uh, absolutely on the, on the, um, you know, our, our mantra, you know, in our business is reinventing contractor service. And that may sound like a lot, but you know, and I know that it's not, it's, it's answering your phone. It's showing up when you say you're going to show up and it's doing the work for how much you said you were going to do it for. If you can hold up those values alone, you have set yourself apart from, 80% 80% of the companies out there. It's kind of sad that that's the bar, but it is. Well, I'll take that all day, right? It's, it's, it's accountability and communication. And even internally with my team, you know, if something fa- fails or falters, it's either accountability or communication. Someone didn't communicate with the next person and tell them that X, Y, Z was supposed to happen, or they dropped the ball and there was no accountability and they just didn't take it on their shoulders as their task to see through. Yeah, um, it, it really is just caring, right? It's, it's caring and, and wanting to do good and see it through. Um, I don't know, half of this, you know, you think nature, nurture, like, can you instill that in an employee or is it something that's just God given and we're born with? Obviously you can instill it. Um, but you have to want it. You have to have a reason to want it. You know, yeah. you have to have kids or, or wife or grandkids or, you know, somebody to, bring money home to and protect like you got to have a reason to live and and want to do well at work 
Yeah, yeah, you do. And and the other part of that too is you casting your vision. Like as an owner or as a manager, you you have to be able to cast your vision of where this company is going, so they want to be part of it, right? Otherwise, there's no value in it for them. And that's right. that's something that I do regularly when I when I show up to a team meeting and I'm I I will restate my vision for the company, why I started it, what my vision was for the employees that I have here, you know. And part of that was if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to have employees again. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to pay damn good because I want these guys to make good money. I want them to love working here and I want them to bring other people in that are good. And, and that's part of my vision as an owner is like, I mean, my guys make really good money and I, I'm happy about it. Yeah. You know, you know what, you know what that really boils down to for me? It's, it's owners. It starts with the owner because the owner has to train the sales team or, you know, instill a skill set or, you know, hire somebody to drive a sales team. The sales team has to go and sell, not take orders because yep. the company needs to come in X amount of dollars in order to pay everybody properly, right? That's right. In order for us to take care of our businesses and our staff, we have to command X amount of dollars per foot. We're not sitting there and just order taking and accepting whatever the home- homeowner is willing to pay us because it's never enough. We have right. to say, this is what we demand. This is how much you're going to pay us to get the, the top quality service that we put out. And with that, I can then bring that money back to the business, pay my staff accordingly, bring in proper materials, and, and the machine keeps turning and turning. But yeah. guys have to break through that mentality of, well, you know, the, the, the market dictates $7 a foot and I'm just keeping up with the Joneses. No, sell better, do better motivate that homeowner to give you what you deserve so that you in turn could keep everybody in your operation happy. It's not there's, easy. A, there's an aspect of that where, you know, an owner operator can sell at seven or eight bucks a foot and make really good money, right? Because you do it all. Yeah, you it's over. But when you're working on a scale and you have to have all the different insurances and the overhead costs that it works when you're staffing a, a larger business, you, you cannot work on that same scale anymore. You have to get the pricing. Totally your, your company has to come first. Your your company has to be profitable, again, to pay people well yeah. and to continue functioning and buying the things you need to uh, inside that company. So, hey, Let me ask you something as an owner, and this always intrigues me as I meet new people and um, you know further my relationships and stuff. What skill sets or w- what would you say is the number one skill set you have that you brought to your business? We can't all be good at everything, right? So, like, what are you best at? What do you what, what do you th- you think you put in injected into uh, your operation that uh, is stamped with Nathan all over it? I'm the risk taker. I am the guy that can see the vision of where my company is going to be in five years, um, and I'm I'm willing to do what it takes to get there. I'm not scared. Just I'm not dipping my foot in. Yeah. When we started this, you know, we had advice from other franchisees and the franchise saying you should start with one truck and work your way up. I'm like, nope, that's not going to work. I already have one truck. Right. I, can, I can do that. Let's uh, let's start with two. And I want three by the end of the year. You know, I want to do that. Sure. And so that carries through because I'm willing to for my employees, I'm willing to whatever tools you need. Like, what do you need? What do you need to be successful? I'm not going to do your job for you, but what do you need that I can give you? to be successful in your job, like right. salesperson, you, you need a better truck. Fine. We'll get you a better truck. You need a better iPad. We'll get you a better iPad, whatever sure. it takes. I'm because yeah, you see the ROI on it. You know, it's, it's, it totally absolutely. makes sense. In, in most cases, sometimes you in can ask for things. You that can't you. be stupid with it, but of course, you know, I, and I, I got a pretty decent head on my shoulder and my wife is my business partner and she's kind of the other side of that. We're like, well, are you sure we need to buy that machine? It's like, yeah, we need to buy that machine. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. So you have the same relationship I have at home. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's the yin and the yang and you have to have it. Yeah, you do. Right. And we work really well together in it. And so we balance each other out and how do we do business that way? Good. I like to hear that. Yeah. How was that as uh, was she doing that? Well, you guys got together young, right? You said you were. In, yeah. I mean, we were early twenties. We were early twenties when we got married and we, we've always ran business together. She's always been good on, you know, QuickBooks and all the back office awesome. stuff. And so she actually did our taxes up until about three years ago when we were just, it's too much money moving yeah, through the company. Crazy. And we finally actually hired a proper, really good accountant. And, and like you said, it's so important to have a guy like that or a person like that on your side as a business owner when you get into scale. Yeah. You know, don't you be afraid, can... guys. You know, guys at home, don't be afraid. Sometimes it's, it's healthy to blow this, to take the pressure off, you know, blow some steam off and, and let a seasoned CPA that knows how to 
play the shell game and move the money around, uh, weigh in and tell you the, the right stuff. I mean, you're not an accountant. I, I started out, I went to the University of Connecticut and I, I started out as an accounting major and I, three months in, I was like, nope. <laughs> not for me. It's not for me. I, I'm telling you that right now. I called my dad at home. I'm like, I'm not doing this. I don't know how you did this stuff, dad. I, this is not my forte, pal. And then I wound yep. up uh, reading Neither. Shakespeare for two years. <laughs> that that and organization for me are very weak points, which is I'd lean on people for stuff like that, you know, which is, I guess, why the franchise attracted me. The organization and systemizing there was really a, a, an outstanding for my, for my weaknesses. And so well, you're a hero to uh, be brave enough to say that and admit that. Organization is not easy. It's uh, not, I find maybe. that that escapes a lot of people. I think it's, uh, that might be, innately you know you're born with that you kind of have like the head for organization some of the most creative amazing talents i i know i mean blow you away with their with their um, artistic savant uh thought processes but you can't find their keys can't find right. their cell phones you know yeah. i mean it's we're all wired differently yeah and that's why you, you, you and what's nice about having a, a business on scale is you can start hiring those specific people into your organization to take care of those weaknesses because and, and, it's their strength. And that's really cool to be able to place somebody in a position specifically to take care of something that is lacking. And that's, yeah. um, that's been neat. Awesome. All right. So what do you think the next five years holds for you? Where do you see yourself in five years? Well, you know, at this point, um, being where I'm at, I, I'm obviously, I, I love the business and I, I love the, ha obviously, I'm not old enough to retire or anything like that or you sell the business yet, but. Who says? Who says? Come on, man. You know, there's always, Whatever there's always the exit strategy talk, right? You have to be talking about exit strategy whenever you have something like 100%. this. 100%. You got to reverse engineer everything. You do. And and so that's kind of what I spend my time doing is talking to people and, and what does this look like? Like I have two sons that are involved in my business. They're installers for me right now. And awesome. would I love to see them take it over at some point? Yeah, I wish, you know, I wish I could, you know, orchestrate that and make that happen. But they're going to have to want it and they're going to have to be Very in, true. involved in a certain way to do that. So how do I do that or how do I structure it? And um, but, yeah, I would love to continue to grow in not necessarily in size although that's possible but in in efficiency and in cash flow net net profits i, I want to hone in on that in over the next couple of years and i want to build a really valuable business that is um saleable if i want to sure. i want to structure the business that is worth something if i need to resell it um that was part of my attraction to a system like this is that you're not just building an, an owner operator business. You're building something that is a business for sale. And right. that's really cool. Uh, especially as I watch the brand grow, it's been basically value building without it's some of it's not my effort, you know, and, and it's, you're part of something way bigger you know, on that. Yeah, scale. I mean, you definitely have a great market. Um, there's a lot of activity down there, a lot of influx, still a lot of people moving in, coming in from uh, all over the place. Yeah. And then maybe, you know, I've done lots of other businesses here and there. We haven't touched on any of them, but, you know, maybe there's something else now while I have some time that I'll be, you know, kind of perk my interest in and get involved in. So um, I'm not really interested in going and spreading more franchises or buying more locations. I'm not really wanting to go start another thing like this. Sure. I like this thing and I like our team. Um, I do want to get it better and then see what else comes. I'm sort of open right now to uh, what I'm involved in. You know, I'll tell you, you, Nathan just hit on this for you guys at home. Half the battle is systemizing, putting people in places so that you're not playing the chief, the cook, and the bottle washer. You're not running around playing every role in the business so that you even have a moment of free time to sit down and even ponder and have conversations with yourself that Nathan and I are just having with each other right now where you're even – thinking about something else you might want to do because you're not scrambling and running off to the supply house to grab material and run it back to Joe and Bobby on the job site. I mean, to just start winning back some of your freedom and your, uh, your you time is everything because once you capture that time and you plug in and you start thinking and using that, that noodle of yours, ideas come to you, right? You start all of a sudden you're looking at something maybe somebody else is doing and you're able to observe because you you've stepped back and you're not so tightly wound up trying to get things, make things jam things, square pegs into round holes. You're, you're, you're actually 
you have time to think and use your brain. That's when things start to come to you. That's when you start to really grow an empire and find the next five moves and um, gain that clarity and that vision. I know as soon as I started to uh, empower staff and find find ways to get the company to self run. Uh, for instance, my my rain gutter business really I'm not involved at all, um, not really at all. I haven't even been on. Shamefully, I mean, I we have um, a production crew, and I you know we create a lot of video content. You see me my video content. I'm so tied up with my software business and my drainage business that I can't stretch myself thin enough. And I made uh, a concession this year, and we we're going to change that. I'm going to be on rain gutter installations and we're going to shoot some new fresh content and mix it up and get the guys, you know, the crews on camera and smiling and demonstrating what they're doing. But when you start putting people in places and systemizing and getting things to sort of automate, that's when you win. That's when you find time to open up a, a you know, a digital agency and uh, build even more SOPs and create content and, I mean, it, it's it's winning back time. That's the the name of the game. Yeah, and everybody has a different twist on it. You know, and I've I've chosen to set it up right now where I'm not involved daily, but some people want to be, and that's great. And you can you can actually keep a little more money for yourself if you do that. Um, so you know, you set it up the way that you want it to look. This, this um, is true. You're right. You know, last year, for instance, one of the reasons I wanted a general manager in place is so that we had a little more time freedom, and, and we got to do a three month road trip last year with our 12 year old. Wow. It's amazing. We took the RV. We went to the East coast. We did all the historical tour early spring. So school was still in he's homeschooled. Um, did you get the crazy satellite phone? Uh, no, I didn't get a satellite phone. <laughs> you didn't even need it, huh? No, we go. Uh, we, I mean, we took Starlink with us, you know, Starlink, we had yeah. all the time. So, uh, but we, yeah, I worked from the road and it was a great time with our family and we got to see yeah. a bunch of like friends along the way and it was neat, you know, priceless, stuff like that. priceless. You, you, you don't get to do that again later on in it. And if you work until you're 75 and then you retire, you're not going to want to do that. You know, you're, right. you're too you're tired, tired for it then too old. So, so this is just priorities that I have, or we have as a family that we're making happen. Um, it costs quite a bit to hire people to replace yourself. It costs a lot of money. So you got to make a lot of money to go through the company to do that. But like you said, it looks different for everybody. But when you write down your goals and what you want to do and go for it, just do the things that it takes to get it done. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I had you on today. I, it's very clear to me that you are doing what you want to be doing and that you're achieving. Um, so my hat goes off. You're definitely an inspiration. And I'm going to have you back on here, man. I think there, I think you're a wealth of knowledge. There's a lot of territory we did not cover that I'd like to get into, namely the other businesses and that sort of thing. Cause there's so many of us guys out here, uh, so just like myself, we, you know, you, you create that revenue stream and it might've start, might've started with rain gutters, but then it evolves into other things. So I, I'd like to get into that stuff on a, at a later date with you. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. That's and I wish you all the best in 2024. Again, we're going to talk soon, but, um, I just want to give you my blessings for a, an amazing year ahead. I uh, thank you, Frank, and I appreciate it. This was a good time, and uh, you know we have a lot in common with our businesses. Like you say, we're sort of on that same page. Besides our kids' ages, you know, <laughs> old dinosaurs. Yeah, I know. <laughs> good to see you, brother. I'll talk to you offline. All right, good to see you, Frank. All right, brother. Take care. Bye.